Oh, Jesus, thank you for joining and being on here tonight. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Hallelujah. We're going to have a good time tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, there's a question that I have, and I want you to write it down. If you're taking notes, please take notes. How do we bring focus to life? How do we bring focus to life? <clears throat> How do we ensure that our life is focused on the things of God, that we are on assignment, that we are doing what God has called us to do? Uh, in this season, uh, especially in this pandemic, it's so easy to lose focus. It's so easy to panic. It's so easy to, to be fearful and to have anxiety. But God wants us to remain focused. He wants us to be focused. And so the question tonight that we seek to answer in this hour is how do we bring focus to life? How do we bring focus to life? First uh, Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Everybody got it? You got it? I, I probably won't be able to hear you say amen, but say amen anyhow. The Bible says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First statement, and the first thing that I want to share with you and I want to tell you and give you instruction is that God inspects you to do more. God expects you to increase. Hallelujah. He expects you to increase. God expects us to go from glory to glory, from strength to strength, from wisdom to wisdom. When we become believers of Jesus Christ, we make a forward movement, never backwards. If we have vision, vision is always for the future. It's always forward thinking. And so we ought to increase. His will is that we increase in knowledge, in strength, in spirituality, in favor, in any, every area of our life. God expects us and his will is that we increase. And so with the understanding that we must live life uh, in increase, the only way for us to do that is to focus on the assignment that God has given to us. Each and every person has an assignment. Uh, and what is the critical thing about every assignment? What is the critical thing? You know, in fact, what I want you to do, I want you to unmute your phones because I'm an interactive person and I may ask some questions and I want you to shout out some answers to me. So I'm going to ask you to just unmute your phones. I know that uh, in Bible study, we don't usually, but uh, I'm going to ask you if you want to participate just unmute the phone uh, so that you can answer some of the questions that I'm going to be posing today. Um, what is an assignment? What is an assignment? Anybody? Anybody? What's an assignment? Can you hear me tonight? A task. The task. Assignment is a task. Okay, an assignment is a responsibility. And how are we successful in our assignment? How can we claim success when we have an assignment or when we have a task or when we have a responsibility? What is the only way that we can say that we are successful? When we accomplish the assignment. Amen. And so we've got to finish what we've started. You got to finish what you started. You've got to complete the task that God has given to you. Every one of us as believers, we have an assignment. There is something that God has assigned to your life. There is a purpose to your existence. You're not just here to waste time. You're not just here to just live day by day, willy-nilly, and do whatever. There is an assignment and there is a deadline. And the deadline is your life. 
because none of us are here forever. And before we leave here, we've got to be active in our assignment. We've got to complete our assignment or at least even start our assignment and be active in it. And, and so that is so important. And there, there are three things, objectives that God has given to every believer. And if you're writing, I want you to write this down. As, as, as pertains to our assignment, there are three things, three objectives that God has for us, three things that he wants us to, uh, that are gonna help us stay focused uh, on our assignment, three things God has done. The first thing is manifest, manifest. And then there's maintain, and then there's maximize. Those three M's are very important. Manifest, maintain, maximize. Now, when we talk about manifesting, what are we manifesting? We, we're manifesting the gift of God. Manifest means to reveal. Manifest means to show. It means to bring forth. And the will of God for your life is, is that you show forth, that you bring forth, you express your God identity. you got to manifest who God has designed you to be. You can't hide. You can't be in a closet. You've got to manifest it. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. You've got to be seen and heard. The believer, especially in this day and age, it's so important that we be seen and heard. You can't be a secret disciple. No, no. You've got to manifest that God identity, that assignment that God has placed on your life. And so when you manifest your God identity, when you, when you embrace who he's called you to be, when you embrace who he has assigned you to be, then that, that identity allows you to be a correct expression of his kingdom in the earth. When you, when you embrace who he's designed you to be, then you walk correctly. You, you become a correct expression. No matter what, if people like you or don't like you, if they accept you or they don't accept you. When, you, when you embrace your God identity, you are on the path to living a correct life. And the only way that you can live a correct life is to express your God identity. And so the first thing I'm going to encourage you to do is to manifest who God's designed you to be. You've got to embrace that. And if you don't know who is it, who is designed you to be, you got to spend some time in his presence. You've got to talk with him. You've got to seek God so that you can know who he's designed you to be so that you can manifest that and manifest the correct things, manifest uh, the correct attitudes, reveal those things, that God identity. Then we maintain our responsibility then after manifesting is maintenance, to maintain. And how do I maintain my identity? How do I maintain who God has designed me to be? I've got to develop correct values. The only way that you are going to maintain that God identity is by looking at what you value. What is valuable to you right now? Value, uh, the novel, another word for value is worth. And from the word worth, we get the word worship. What are you worshiping? Are you worshiping your job? Are you worshiping your home, your car? Are you worshiping your family? What are you worshiping? What, what is most valuable to you? And God has to be the, the most valuable thing in your life. And so you've got to maintain uh, that identity by developing the correct values, by understanding what is a priority, what is valuable, what is worthy, what, what things that go along with God's intention for your life, what God has intended for you. There are some things that he has not intended for you to be involved in that you're involved in. There are some things that you are putting too much value on that God is saying you shouldn't have value on those things. You got to have value on your assignment. 
You got to have value on the identity that he's created within you. Uh, and so uh, that can only be achieved by developing attitudes of dependence on God. You got to depend on God. When you depend on God, then there is a flow of the spirit of God in your life that will help you to maintain that identity, maintain that gift and maintain that calling. And then the third one is maximized. So manifest, maintain, maximize. We're going to manifest our God identity. We're going to maintain that identity by developing uh, value, by developing core values in our life, correct values. And then we maximize, we maximize who God has designed us to be. Well, another word for maximize means to advance, to move forward, maximize, to make larger, to spread. And so that's God's intention and God's plan for your life is that you manifest, that you, the real you comes forth. The real you that Jesus Christ died for. The real gifted you. Those gifts that are hidden. Those gifts that you're not activating. God wants you to manifest them. And then he wants you to develop correct values. Correct worth. Correct worship. And then maximize that. Maximize that gift. Advance it. God wants to use you to advance his kingdom. He wants to use you and your gifting. He wants to use you and the calling on your life to advance his kingdom. Jesus said that we should pray to the Lord of the harvest. Why? Because the harvest is ready. The harvest is ripe. He says the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the vineyard. You are the laborer. God has called you, not just Pastor Brown, not just Pastor Dennis. God has called you to be a laborer in his vineyard. And you've got to bring focus to your life. You've got to focus on the life that God has given you and the life that he's called you to. And maximize those giftings, use them, everything about you ought to advance the kingdom of God. Not just church. It's not about just going to church. As you've seen for over a year, we've not been in a church building. We've not been in a church building. People are trying to go back to church. They go back to the building. A couple of weeks later, you know, we're told we can't be in the building. Christianity is not about a building. We're not trying to maximize a building, we're trying to maximize the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not contained in a building. The kingdom of God is not contained in religious activity. The kingdom of God is not just seen on a Sunday. It's every day of your life. The kingdom of God is when you get on the subway. The kingdom of God is when you walk up and down in your office, in your home, wherever you are, you bring the kingdom. You ought to manifest and maintain and maximize the kingdom of God through your attitude, through your mentality, through your, the things that you value. That's how we begin to bring focus to life. So there were three answers to the question, how do I bring focus to life? Uh, if you're writing, write this down. The first thing that you've got to do is live on purpose. You got to live on purpose. You ever had somebody do something to you, you know, uh, that was offensive to you and you know, and you realize like they intended on doing it. You tell them you did that on purpose. They meant to do it. Well, God says, you've got to live like you mean to live. Everything you do mean to do it. You've got to live on purpose. And, and you look at that two ways. You got to live according to the purpose, the right purpose. You got to know what your purpose is. The greatest tragedy in life is not death. It's life with no purpose. Mm -mm. Because if you live a purposeful life and you complete your purpose, then death is a welcome friend. Death is just a door that takes you to another level. Death 
is not tragic. Death is only tragic for people that have not lived. If you have lived, then the next step is death. And I'm not being morbid, but I'm showing you that before death, there must be a purpose to your life. And it is guaranteed that every one of us, if the Lord tarries, we are going to die. And so we're not to be afraid of death. We're not to fear death. What we should be afraid of is, am I living on purpose? Am I living on purpose? Look at Ephesians. I, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 15 to 17. Ephesians chapter 5, 15 to 17. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. And the Bible says, look carefully then at how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time claiming and seizing every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be vague or thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. I want to read that again. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 from the Amplified Version. Look carefully then. Look carefully how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of every opportunity uh, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be vague or thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. The King James says that we should walk circumspectly and, and circumspectly means that we should be careful, cautious with how you live. You, you've got to be vigilant with how you live. You got to live on purpose. You don't just float through life. You don't just fall into things. No, you got to be careful. You got to be vigilant. You got to be watch, watchful. The Bible says, not as fools. Fools are people that are not wise. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming, buying back the time. Redeeming. Redeem means to buy back. When you redeem is a financial term. You redeem money. You buy back. Uh, and, and so the Bible says that we are to redeem the time. That means you've lost time. If you got to buy back time, it means that you're behind time. And so what God is telling us as believers is to recognize that we are behind time. We're behind. In, in, according to what he's called us to do, we are behind time. And so we got to be cautious from this moment onward. We got to be careful and vigilant in how we live. We've got to seize every opportunity. That means God is placing opportunities before you. He's given you opportunities and you got to seize those opportunities. That's how you bring focus to life. You look for the God-given opportunities. God, is this an open door? God, is this the path that you want me to take? And then you seize it. You don't wait. You, 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 you don't hesitate. You seize that opportunity because the days are evil and because we are running out of time. He says that we've got to understand what the will of God is. We can't be ill-advised. We can't be stupid. We must understand what the will of God is for our life. And the reason why a lot of us don't understand the will of God is because we've never asked. We've never sought God really to know what his will is for our life. What is the will of God for your life? I guarantee that the will of God for your life is more than just you coming to church, more than you just attending Bible study and hearing Pastor Brown or Pastor Dennis teach and preach the word. The will of God for your life is that you advance his kingdom. The will of God for your life 
is that you let the light of Jesus shine through you in your particular way, according to your particular gift. And you've got to get in tune with your gift. You got to tune up your instrument and start playing. You got to tune up your life and start living a God-centered life so that his kingdom will be advanced. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 38 in, in, the, in the Amplified Version. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be firm, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Look at this. He says, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough in the service of the Lord, going beyond knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile. Everything that you do for God is not futile. It is never wasted or it is, it is never to no purpose. Everything that you do for God is purposeful. Hallelujah. And, and, and so our first point is that, that in order for us to find focus, we've got to live on intentional living. You're writing, write that down, intentional living. When we look at the word intentional, what does the word intentional mean? Come on, somebody talk to me. Intentional. On purpose. On purpose. Give me more. Characterized by intent. Characterized by intent. That's just a clever way of saying intentional. <laughs> Give me more. Premeditated. <laughs> ah, premeditated. That's a word that I have right there. Premeditated. Now, what is important about that word premeditated? The word premeditated is used, and I'm sure I preached about this a little while ago. It's, it's, um, it's used in, 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 in law and in, in court proceedings. And so uh, when a murder has been committed, that murder can either be manslaughter or it can be a third degree, second degree or first degree murder. And every crown attorney or every prosecutor when it comes to murder always seeks uh, for, for, um, for um, murder in the first degree. And in order for murder to be in the first degree, it has to be premeditated. That means, here's another word, it was calculated that the person sat down and thought. This wasn't accidental. This wasn't a, a crime of passion. This wasn't a murder of passion where they got angry and just in a fit of rage, they killed somebody. No, for it to be first degree murder, and first degree murder means that you will go away for life. In order for it to be first degree murder, it has to be premeditated. That means that there was an intent before the act. Oh my God, that there's an intention before the action. And so if you're going to live intentionally, what are your intentions before you act? That means you've got to think. You've got to premeditate on what you should do before you act. You don't just live sloppy. You don't just go out and decide that you're going to buy a house. No, you think about it. You look at your finances. There's an intention before the action. Thoughts come before the action. You're intentional about it. You're calculated. What does it mean to calculate? Calculate means that you sum up. It means that you do the math, you, you ruminate. God wants you to be calculated. Glory to God. He wants you to be calculated. He wants you to be premeditated and being intentional. If you're writing, write this down. Being intentional is really as simple as having a clear idea of what you want to accomplish. Having a clear idea of what you want to accomplish before you start. What do you want to accomplish this year? What do you want to accomplish next year? What do you want to accomplish with your life? And so being intentional is having a clear idea of what you want to accomplish, really knowing why you want to accomplish this, why you've deemed it worthy of your time and your energy and your resources and your effort. 
Uh, being intentional means that you identify what steps are necessary each day to ultimately take you closer to where you want to be. Calculated steps. The Bible says the steps of the good man, they are ordered by the Lord. They are calculated. Your steps must be calculated. You don't just get up in the morning, come out of your house and walk. No, you're walking somewhere. You don't just get in your car and just drive. No, you calculate a journey. And if you, even when you don't know where you're going, you put it into your GPS. And what does your GPS do? It calculates the route. Hallelujah. So that you don't waste that. And it calculates the quickest, the fastest route. It premeditates that there's going to be a light here. And, and, and some of our GPSs are so smart that it will tell us where there's an accident and it will re-navigate the route. It's calculating. Your life has to be the same. You've got to be a calculated person. You know, often, you know, that's looked at in the negative when you tell somebody that you're calculated. Well, you need to now rejoice over that. That's actually good. You've got to be calculated. You've got to be premeditated. You've got to be intentional. That's how you bring focus to your life. You got to be intentional. Here's a word that we don't like, discipline. We got to be disciplined. Somebody give me an example of discipline or, or um, uh, give me a definition of discipline. What, what does discipline mean to you? Come on, somebody, tonight. unwavering from um what is the word like a set plan or routine or like would you have to get done you don't waver from that you stay focused with your eyes on that prize and you have to do it and that's the right. good so you said routine and you said unwavering and unwavering routine that's so consistent that's anybody else Consistency. 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 Discipline. You know, in, in, in our ethnicity, you know, when we heard the word discipline, we look for a belt or a shoe or a slipper. Or if it was my mother, she looked for the dutchy pot. Discipline is not about beating a person. Discipline is about teaching them to be consistently wise to be consistently good. Discipline is about getting into a routine and staying in that routine. So let, let me give you my definition of discipline. Discipline is deliberate disciplined actions, deliberate actions. You, 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 you do it every day. The person that disciplines his body and works out, he, he, has, he has enforced obedience. That, that, that's what discipline is. It is enforced forced obedience. When you discipline your child, you are enforcing obedience into that child. You're, you're, you're making sure that they understand this is right, this is wrong. Your life has to be disciplined. Your life has to have, as my sister said, an unwavering routine. What is your unwavering routine? Do you pray every morning? Do you worship? Are you in the word? Is this unwavering? Is it consistent? That's how you're going to bring focus in your life by being consistent. Whether, listen, there are some things that we do no matter what, whether the sun shines, whether it's rainy, you can't blame it on whether you, you've got to, there's some things that you got to do no matter what the weather, no matter what season, no matter that we are in a pandemic. No matter that the world is in a crisis, we still have to be disciplined. There still needs to be an unwavering routine to our life. We don't have to feel good about it because the Bible says no discipline feels good. So it's not about feeling good about it. Some people will only do what feels good. You know, you want a better body. You're going to have to do some things that don't feel good. You're going to have to eat some foods that don't taste too good. It's not about feeling. It's about your objective. It's about your focus. It's about where you're trying to get to. 
And it may not feel good right now, but in the long term, it's going to bring you success if you remain disciplined. And, 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 and so you got to be disciplined. You got to be wise. Discipline yourself, even in your conversation. Discipline yourself in what you respond to. Discipline yourself in how you manage your life and only manage critical, uh, critical uh, uh, issues of life. Drop the trivialities. Don't be trivial. Don't focus on trivial things, but discipline yourself. That's the first point in how we bring focus to life. The second point, because I only got 20 minutes left, is increase your thinking. I want you to write that down. And so the question is, how do I bring focus to life, right? The first one was what? Uh, live on purpose, intentional living. The second one is increase your thinking. Increase your thinking. I want you to write that down because your life should be better since you got saved. My life should be better since I got saved. John 10 and verse 10 says that the thief has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so life should be better. And life becomes better when we increase our thinking. Uh, the, the will of God then doesn't automatically just come to pass in our life. Uh, we need to be willing to participate in the will of God. And so if we got to increase our thinking, what are some of the barriers to, in, to, to increasing our thinking? Because there is an attack on our thinking. And thinking is critical. We use our head to think. And what is, what is so significant about our head? What, what is so significant about our head? How is a baby born? Somebody tell me. Anybody there? Am I talking to myself? The baby, go ahead first. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it our thoughts? Well, let me check and see if anybody's our Bible study. Because, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's at least 10 of us. Whoa, you guys have me nervous thinking that I'm talking to myself. Uh, a baby comes out what? Head first. First. Right? If that baby's not born head first, they say that the baby's breech. Right? So head first. Look at that. The first thing that enters the world is your head. I bet mean, you never thought about that. The first thing that gets into the world before your body, your head. Now, if you're going to be a basketballer, you're going to need your hands. If you're going to be a painter, you're going to need your hands. If you're going to be, you know, a soccer player, you're going to need your feet. Right? But before all of that, the first thing that comes into the world is your head. Head first. Somebody write that down. Head first. You got to increase your thinking. Babies are born head first. That means if I can get my head out, then the rest of the body will come out. My God. If I can get my, my head right, then I can get my finances right. If I can get my head right, I can get my emotions right. If I can get my head right, I can get my actions right because my head controls everything. My head controls everything. How many, how many things, how many opportunities have been destroyed because your head wasn't right? How many marriages, how many relationships have been destroyed because our head isn't right or wasn't right? We've got to increase our thinking and have the correct type of thinking. You got to get your head out first. Somebody will tell you it's all in your head. It's all, and it is, it's all in your head. Your success, it's in your head. I feel like preaching. Let me calm down because it's Bible study. I'm not supposed to be preaching, right? But your success, that new job, that new idea, that song that you're going to write, that book that you're going to write, that business that you're going to start, where is it? It's all in your head. It's all in your head. And you got to get your head out first. Some of us are breached. We're trying to come out feet first. 
Some of us are trying to come out hands first. We're trying to grab things when we haven't even thought about it. You're trying to do stuff that you haven't thought. No, 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 baby. Head first. Don't worry about the action. Don't worry. You know, I always tell people in accomplishing anything, a business or whatever, you know, the first thing you go after is not the money. The first thing you go after is what? The idea. Because if you don't have a good idea, but you got money, you're going to waste that money. But if you have a great idea, and if you focus on the idea, then when the money comes, you know exactly what to do with the money. Can I hear somebody say amen? I know it's just Bible study, and I know there's just 10 of us, but somebody please say amen. 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 So, I, listen, I want you to catch this. How much more time do I have? 15 minutes. How you think, how you process is critical. Oh my God, I want you to catch this. How you think is critical. Anybody ever asked you or you asked somebody, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? You look at somebody and they're wearing something and you're like, what were you thinking? Obviously you were not thinking to wear that or to do that. What are you thinking? That is my question to you right now. How do I find focus in life? I got to live on purpose and I got to increase my thinking. I got to come out head first. What are you thinking? Because it's all in your head. A, a good teacher teaches you to do more than memorize, right? A, a good teacher teaches you how to think. Yeah, good teachers, they don't just teach you to memorize. They teach you how to think, right? Because what do you do when you run into a problem that you haven't memorized the solution to? No, you got to think. You need to think. Every problem you have in your life, you can think your way out of it. You can think your way out of it. When you seek advice from a friend or a family member or a person, you know, the first thing you do after telling them the scenario, you know, you, you say to them, well, Tell me what you think. How many of us have done? We do that all the time. You know, you, 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 when you have a dilemma and you go to somebody, you ask someone, what do you think? What are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts? Not your feelings. What do you think about this? You, you, you know, because your, your thoughts are powerful. Your thoughts are powerful. Let me tell you that it, it, it's not just enough to know God's word. You got to know God's thoughts. You got to know the thoughts of God because everything that he said came from what he thought. His word is established on his thoughts. So even with God in creating the world, it was head first. It was thoughts, then actions. And you got to start thinking out of the wealth of God's thoughts. He created the world. He established the world, out to the wealth of his thoughts. And let me tell you, you will never establish anything until you start thinking. I want you to write that down. That should be a slogan. Put it on social media and then say, Pastor Richard Brown said, you will never establish anything until you start thinking. And God has given you the ability to think. Think your way out of that problem. Think your way out of poverty, into prosperity. Think your way out of sickness, into healing. You, he's given you that ability. You are creative. Somebody touch yourself and say, I am creative. You touch yourself, touch your mind and say, I am creative. God designed you that way. You are creative and that's how you're going to bring focus to your life. You're going to increase your thinking. Use your God-given creativity. Look at it. God didn't give us chairs. He gave us trees. He gave us a tree and somebody saw, somebody thought, hold up, I can get a chair out of that tree. Now God has given you a stump of wood. You've got to look into that wood and you've got to carve out the purpose. He's not just going to give you the purpose. You've got to think, use your creativity. My time is running. I wish I had time to stay on that point. But you got to think, you got to practice being creative. That's how you're going to find purpose to your life. Practice uh, being creative when you step into a dilemma or you have a problem 
or a situation and you don't see what you need, don't crumble. Don't crumble. Don't give up. Use your God-given ability to think and create what you need. Let me tell you something. You are too creative to live like a fool. You got too much creativity to be foolish. You got too much creativity, God-given creativity to fail or to sink. Zacchaeus was a thinker, wasn't he? Zacchaeus was a short little man and he wanted to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way. Zacchaeus, what am I going to do? I want to see Jesus. Jesus is about to pass by. He thought, he saw us at Sycamore Tree. And he said, yeah, if I climb that tree, he used his creativity. I preached that years ago. He made an adjustment. He climbed the sycamore tree. He used his creativity to see his goal. And his goal was to see Jesus. Use your creativity. That's how you're going to bring purpose to your life. In this season, you got to think, get your head in the game. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, write it down, Proverbs 23 and verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you got to think, you got to think. The battleground is against your mind. The enemy is coming against your mind. That's why he's trying to drive you out to your mind. Yeah, he's using the things that you're, you're experiencing in life and he's trying to send you cuckoo and crazy in your thoughts. Thinking, well, this person don't like me. This is not going to work out. There's an attack on your mind. And some of us, can't, you can't even sleep at night because your mind is so crowded because the enemy knows that if your mind is ever free, hallelujah, to think the way that God has created for you to think, you will bust free. You will break free. The attack is on your mind. The Bible says in, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Is it 4? 4 verse 10. Somewhere around there, it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of high things. Pulling down strongholds, every high thing that, that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. The high things are coming against your mind. It's coming, it's attacking your mind, attacking your thoughts. It's attacking what you know of God. So you know that you're loved, but you don't feel loved. You know that you're blessed, but you don't feel blessed. You know that you're delivered, but you don't feel delivered. The, the, the high things, the enemy is attacking your mind and trying to feel, feel you out of what you know. Trying to convince you that you don't know what you know trying to convince you that God don't love you, yet you know God loves you. The high things come to emotionally convince you that you are not loved. The enemy, he tries to convince you that you don't have what God has already said that you have. The devil is a liar. The enemy comes with imaginations and suggestions. He comes with thoughts. It's all in your head. He uses circumstances uh, and he uses people. He uses critics to pump you uh, with false propaganda about yourself. I feel like I'm preaching right now. I really need to calm down. And it's all designed to destroy your confidence and your faith in God and cause you to lose focus. Uh, but the devil is a liar tonight. You will not lose focus. Uh, because whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is faithful, whatsoever is of a good report, think on those things. Somebody say glory to God, glory to God. In 2021, the enemy is not going to feel me out of my blessing and imagine me out of my destiny. No, no, no. I'm going to imagine myself free. I'm going to imagine myself whole. And whatever I lose, I'm not going to lose my head. Whatever you lose, don't you lose your head. Don't you lose your ability to think. Glory to God. Third point. Third point. I got six minutes. So how do we find focus in life? What was the first one? We live on purpose. Second one, increase your thinking. Get your head out. Third one. Live under priority. Write those down. How do I find purpose in life? 
Number one, I live on purpose. How do I find focus in life? I live on purpose, number one. Number two, I increase my thinking. And number three, I live on the priority. When we talk about priority, the word priority talks about importance and significance. That, that's what the word priority, if you look up the word priority, that's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see importance and significance. And, and as I close with this, this is so critical. I, I, I charge you as your pastor, as your brother, as your friend, live under priority. Live under priority. You've got to look at, live by what is important and what is significant. What are the important things? What are the significant things? What is a priority? What has God deemed to be a priority in your life? Those are, those are the things that you've got to gravitate to. Be careful who you connect with. Only connect with people that advance your purpose. People that are going in the same direction. People that advance your purpose and your destiny. People, uh, people and their issues will slow you down. You, you, you ever get connected to the wrong people, they will slow you down. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16 says, shun. You got to shun profane and idle babbling, idle talk. Shun it. Get it away from you. That's what Paul told Timothy. Shoo it. Shoo away. Profane. Foolishness. Foolish talk. You ever been around some people that just talk foolishness? Just take your time and move yourself away from them. Shun it. Some of the things that are entertaining to you, you need to shun those things. Some of the things that you're watching on Netflix, foolishness. Some of the conversations you're having, some of the things you're doing online. No, live under priority. What is important and what is significant? Those things aren't important. If they're not significant, if they're not necessary, Paul says shun them because they're gonna take away your focus. They're gonna take away your focus. Speak only when you have to. I've learned, I've learned that. I speak only when I have to. There are many times I have to bite my tongue, which you don't do it, don't say it. It's none of your business. Let it slide. This is not important. This is not significant. It's not a priority in my life. I'm gonna pay attention to the business that pays me. If this don't pay me, I'm not paying attention to it. Why should I pay attention to it? And it's not going to turn around and pay me. It's above my pay grade. No, you got to live under priority. You, 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 you got to focus on what is important. Focus on, on what is significant. Uh, and, and be careful who you agree with. There's a story in the Bible. It's not a story. It's an actual fact. Uh, uh, um, king David was king and then his, his son Solomon was king and then after, after him his son uh, Rehoboam I think I preached about it Rehoboam became king and Rehoboam was a young guy and uh, he was in a situation um, where uh, he, he needed some advice in terms of the nations that he was ruling over and he asked some of his peers he asked some of his friends his, his brethren he asked some of his young boys you know and they gave him foolish advice and he heeded their advice and split the kingdom. Rehoboam split the kingdom so that now you had, um, you had Judah in, in the south and Israel to the north, a split divided kingdom. You gotta be careful who you agree with. He agreed with them. You gotta understand the law of association. Uh, asso association shape your influence. They shape your influence. They, they, they mold. You can be molded by public opinion. Stop being molded by what people think or by what people say. Be careful of your associations. Those that you spend the most time with. Who are you spending most of your time with? They affect your outcome. Whether you succeed or whether you fail is often based on what you're spending the most of your time with. Uh, 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 associations create your atmosphere and your atmosphere creates your tradition and your tradition creates your culture and your culture it determines your future determines your future you want me to say it again your associations they create an atmosphere and your atmosphere it creates your traditions yeah and your traditions it creates your culture 
and your culture determines your destiny. Because culture, I'm not talking about black or white, culture is cultic. It's the things that you do. The routine culture. This is my culture to do this. My culture to do such and such. Your culture, the things that you do determine where you go. And so you got to be careful of the atmosphere that is around you. My time is gone. It's, it's, it's 8.30. Live under priority. I'm going to give you this scripture and we're going to close out. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. This is one of my mantras in life. She says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. So tonight in an hour, we've asked the question, how do I find focus in my life? How, how do I find focus? Number one, we talked about, I've got to understand that God has called me to manifest, to maintain, and to maximize, manifest that God identity, manifest that gifting that he's given me. Then I've got to maintain it by having the correct values. And then I've got to maximize those values, maximize those giftings, advance the kingdom of God. And then we answer the question, how do I find focus in life? Three answers. Number one, I live on purpose. Number two, increase my thinking. Number three, I live under priority. I pray that you're blessed tonight. Are there any questions? Any questions uh, that, that, that before we close up in prayer or any comments that you want to make, unmute your phones and anything that you want to ask me, go ahead and ask. Yeah, Pastor, can you say uh, the last sentence you, you said again about the association? Which one? Yes, associations. Associations said, create your atmosphere? Yeah. So associations create your atmosphere your atmosphere creates your traditions. Your traditions create your culture. And your culture determines your destiny. Right. Say it again. I think that's good. Association, atmosphere, culture, tradition, destiny. Yeah, so associations, they create your atmosphere. Perfect. Your atmosphere creates your traditions. Your traditions create your culture, and your culture determines your destiny. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Amen. Anybody else? Any questions? Hallelujah. Well, I'm glad that you're blessed. Tonight, I've been blessed to teach. I think maybe I should teach Bible study more often. I really enjoyed it. Just sitting on my couch, didn't have to dress up or anything. This is wonderful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pray that you are blessed. And I pray that you get in the word. I'm just going to read that scripture that we started off with uh, one more time. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You got to remain that way. You got to, that's how you find focus to life. Let's pray tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word, it brings light and life to us. And, and, and God, we've asked the question, how do we find focus in our life? Especially in a season where there's just no focus. God, we're living in a season where there's uncertainty. You know, we're going from lockdown to lockdown. Mighty God, the children are uncertain. There's so much uncertainty around us. There's so much pain, so much sickness, disease, viruses that are, are flying through the air. But yet you still call us to find focus in our lives. Mighty God, even in this pandemic, in this season of crisis, we're committing to manifesting the gifts that you placed in us, manifesting that God identity. We're committing to maintaining that identity. We're not going to allow the crisis of this day to reshape or, or to, to change our identity, mighty God, but we will maintain that identity with correct values. 
my God, with correct disciplines. And then we will maximize, even in a pandemic, we're going to let our light shine. We're going to advance your kingdom. We're going to find focus in life by living on purpose, intentional, premeditated, and calculated. God, we're going to be disciplined. We're going to enforce obedience. God, then we're going to increase our thinking. Help us to get our head right. Get our head back in the game. Head first. Mighty God, increase our thinking. And then, Father, we want to live under priority, that which is important and significant. We're going to be careful of our associations because they create our atmospheres. And our atmospheres create our traditions. Our traditions create our culture, and our culture determines our destiny. I pray that every person under the sound of my voice will be blessed. Their families will be blessed. I pray that they would walk in divine health and divine prosperity. And God, we will be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I pray that you've enjoyed uh, this Bible study. I've gone, what, six minutes over. That's not too bad. <laughs>